You're listening to the Creative Field Recording Podcast, where we learn about capturing audio beyond the studio and sharing sound with others. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Paul Vorosvic, and I am your host for the Creative Field Recording Podcast. This is Episode 1, Common Mistakes and How to Fix Them, Field Recording Basics. Today, we'll talk about common errors beginners and pros alike make while recording sounds in the field. A note, like every episode, this is a reading of the weekly blog post on creativefieldrecording.com. This one was published May 1st, 2019. For our first few episodes, the podcast will be an audio version of the written articles on the blog for people who prefer listening to reading on the website. The idea is to keep it simple, and perhaps we'll grow the podcast later. Let's get started. You hold a triple A tier microphone in your hand. An audio recorder with whisper quiet preamps is by your side. Perhaps you're deep in a jungle with modern noise miles away. Maybe you've arranged a block of dry ice for ideal squeaks and hisses. Every checklist item is ticked. You're ready to create inspiring sounds and commit them to tape. You're sure you've done all you can to capture perfect field recordings. The reality, it's often not enough. Why? Well, even the best gear and most diligent preparations overlook small problems that can threaten field recordings and sound libraries. Today's episode begins a short series looking at common, yet overlooked, errors. It describes why they happen and how they can be fixed. We'll be looking at field recording mistakes, In the following week's episodes, we'll look at problems when mastering clips and curating them later. A running list. Over the years, I've been fortunate to hear a lot of sound libraries. Many have been polished community bundles I've listened to while adding them to the sound effects search independent sound library index. At times, I've consulted for various online stores and have added thousands of clips to their shops. I've also mastered raw sound effects for others, both veterans and aspiring newbies alike, as well as critiquing and cleaning my own field recording efforts, of course. This has provided a unique opportunity, the chance to listen to a full range of field recordings from the second they are copied from a recorder to the moment they appear in a web shop. Through the years, I've noticed common mistakes made when recording, mastering, and curating sound effects. The interesting thing is that most are easily fixed, as you'll hear later. The biggest challenge? Awareness. Not everyone knows every problem that can entangle a sound clip's journey. So, this list is meant to help share ideas and generate awareness. My hope is that it will help improve everyone's technique in the field, behind the edit desk, and while sifting through text in metadata apps. Sound Mistakes I often cringe when I think back to when I began field recording, around 1996 or so. I made many mistakes. Given what I know now, some are embarrassing oversights or thoughtless blunders of technique. That can happen to anyone, of course. With the craft of field recording, it becomes even more pronounced. Why? Field recording is a tangential craft that often grows out of music recording, production sound, or other audio professions. There isn't an established methodology taught in universities or workshops worldwide, or a field recording union to share guidance. The effect is that much of field recording must be learned by experiencing it on one's own. This is compounded by the fact that there are endless types of sounds to capture, and each requires a slightly varied technique. It's important to remember this when listening to the list later. Because there isn't a silver bullet to learning field recording technique, What seems common sense to one person may be a revelation to another. The suggestions here and in the following episodes will be a running list. For today, we'll look at mixing dominant subjects, recording copyrighted audio, working with others, skipping slating, fixing it in post, and forgetting to listen. Mixing dominant subjects. One of the most common errors I hear is mixing dominant subjects. This happens when a field recording captures sounds from two strong sources at once. An example may be a recording of a marsh with a crowd chatting nearby. Why is this a problem? Mixed subject recordings are unusable. 
This is because people who want a marsh atmosphere don't usually want the sound of people talking. Those that want recordings of chatting will find the marsh birds and frogs interfering with the voices they need to hear. It's an odd example, I know. It's rare to need a recording of both marsh sounds and people. Just the same, the point is these montage type recordings have less value because they're so specific. Few people will need a crowd of 10 people chatting and evening frogs. But in the unusual event that someone is looking for this exact soundscape, they'll likely need each subject separate. That is, two sound effects, one of the marsh and another of the people. Most projects will add these separately so the presence of each can be adjusted to taste. If both the marsh and people are in the same recording, it's impossible to diminish the voices and raise the gain of the frogs. That's much easier when they're separate. So it's important to capture these subjects with distinct recordings. Why do people mix subjects? It's actually a natural mistake for those beginning field recording. Not everyone has the benefit of needing trimmed and mastered tracks for game audio or film sound. Aspiring field recordists may not know the needs of those projects. They're primarily field recordists and simply capture all they hear. What's more, it's very difficult to isolate only a single subject. Often, a problem sound may intrude on your target subject despite your best intentions. So, what do you do when you're recording a marsh environment and hear voices? Change your position so you can capture either one or the other. Or simply wait until the people leave. On the blog, I wrote about four tips to deal with these situations. Alter the pickup pattern, exercise patience, change position, or the perspective. In the end, resist capturing field recordings with mixed subjects. Removing one subject from a mixed recording takes more work than it is worth. Here are other common mixed subjects to avoid. Traffic heard in other ambiences such as crowds, markets, church bells, and so on. Other ambience mixed in with traffic such as voices with car passes over cobblestones. Rain mixed with traffic or trains or people. Parks, forests, or other environments with airplanes flying above. Any ambience with background vent, fridge, compressor hum, and so on. Crowd ambience with car alarms going off in the background. A baby crying, phone ringing, or other strong, distracting sounds mixed with any other sound. A note, these recordings have value in slice-of-life field recordings for recreational listening. In all other cases, keep dominant subjects separate. Recording copyrighted audio. This is related to the last tip. How? It also concerns mixing two types of subjects. In this case, it blends your target with copyrighted sound. This is a problem because copyrighted material belongs to someone else. The result? Once copyrighted audio enters your track, you can't use the field recording without their permission. So all the time you've spent recording pedestrian crowds is wasted if radio is playing in the background. Here are common examples of copyrighted audio. Radio, television, buskers, public address announcements, music in airliners, music in airports, Muzak in elevators or offices, distant club bass beat, mobile phone ringtones, any device sound that is closely tied with their brand, Windows or Mac startup tone, video game sounds, guns, the Pac-Man ghost movement sound, and so on. Other sounds that are considered performances, such as church sermons, street performers, and so on. The point is often debated on field recording forums. In the end, though, it's helpful to adopt another point of view. Capture field recordings that focus on and amplify your own creative expression. Either way, only clean recordings can be shared in projects and on web shops. Stop recording when you hear a copyrighted audio and capture another sound. Working with others. Field recording is an exciting craft. We're called upon to visit unusual locations or capture thrilling subjects. We often have the temptation to share it with others. In the end though, field recording is best done alone. Why? Every person added to a session risks contributing intrusive sounds, foot scuffs, stomach grumbles, sniffs, coughing, and so on. 
It's worse when you add talent that has little experience with field recording. They may speak at the wrong time, forget to take their keys off their belt loops, or wear a scratchy nylon jacket sound pros have learned to avoid. That includes photographers and filmmakers. It's natural to want to document recording tigers or experiencing ancient ruins as wind whistles through them. Be careful. A single DSLR shutter snap can ruin a recording. A filmmaker may cross in front of a microphone and warp the stereo image. I've heard dozens of tracks where recordists implore others to not even whisper. A friend may shift their feet, not knowing that it will make it to tape. It's understandable. Few people except the recordists themselves know how sensitive their microphones are. The excitement of a session may bubble over in those not experienced with the thrill of capturing a rare sound. Reduce the risk by recording solo. Skipping slating. Slating field recordings is a vital skill to develop. A verbal ID spoken as recording begins shares what a recording will be and where it is done. A tail slate after a recording describes how the sound evolved in key events. It's rarely done. I think this is because most people expect to master their own field recordings. Perhaps they expect they'll remember everything when they finally sit down in the edit suite later. It's a gamble. Why? Often we can't edit our tracks as soon as we like. Details fade from memory. Sometimes one take rolls after another. Later you may wonder, how are they different? What was I thinking at the time? The challenge grows with every microphone added. Is that second microphone 10 meters from the first? Which direction is it facing? Why does the third microphone stop and restart? This is more pronounced when cleaning someone else's audio. Without a verbal slate, a mastering tech may have no idea where the microphone was placed, the location details, or that strange sound that occurred midway. Often an aspect of the recording changes midway. Why does the image shift? Was the microphone moved? Why did the gain ramp up suddenly? For the first minute, the metal hits sounded dull. Now they're sharp. Why? What changed? Without slating, valuable evocative details are lost. Without them, track descriptions become generic. Bland track details aren't interesting. Those clips won't be chosen and rarely used. Help the mastering tech, and yourself, by slating before and after the take. Identify the subject, the performance, microphone type and recorder, and position. If using multiple microphones, walk through each of them and share where they are relative to one another and the goal of each position. Fix it in post. It's a phrase often heard on television and film sets. Fix it in post. It's universally dreaded by sound crew. What does it mean? Well, sometimes a problem on set can't be solved at the time. Imagine an unseen distant train passing during a take. Normally, the take would be reshot to capture cleaner dialogue without the background rail clatters. However, light is fading and there's no way to reshoot and get the next scene before sundown. So, the director decides to move on and fix the dialogue in post-production later. Seen from the most critical perspective, fix it in post is a way of passing responsibility down the line. It forces the next person to figure it out. This can be especially difficult since the problem solver won't have direct experience of the issue. The upshot? Not only will the results be weaker than what was originally intended, but they'll be less informed too. It's a fast track to substandard performances. There's a more realistic way of looking at it though. Often hundreds of people are being paid. Going into overtime to fix a shot, rates explode. Sometimes environmental issues can't be avoided. On set, these are real issues that can't be sidestepped. Often fixing an issue takes more time than it's worth. So in these cases, fixing it in post is the best choice. Field recorders also experience problems that cannot be avoided. Maybe your river recording location picks up distant highway traffic. Perhaps your landslide rock tumbles have nearby bird chirps. There's a difference when fixing these though. Field recorders have more flexibility. They don't have an entire crew waiting for them. They can respond to problems more nimbly. Just the same, many field recorders record anyway and adopt the fix it in post mentality. It's rarely a good idea. Filmmakers know that automated dialogue replacement, or ADR, 
neither matches the emotional impact or timing of original performances. It's the same when field recording. While clever mastering can fix a lot of problems, it risks contributing bigger issues. An overchopped atmosphere can become a Frankenstein-esque mishmash of edits. It can EQ a track within an inch of its life when removing hum, buzz, traffic rumble, and more. Noise reduction tools are impressive, but they can also suck the life out of a track when used carelessly. The result is that a fix-it-in-post mentality is corrosive. It's a way of admitting that nothing can be done to solve the problem. It's gambling that a problem can be fixed later. It also wastes time. These problems are rarely fixed quickly when mastering. What's worse, it risks losing a field recording's greatest asset, its authenticity. Instead, fix the issues at the time. Navigate to a better location to avoid problem sounds. Often, this may require shifting a few meters. Waiting out a plane passing overhead may save hours in the edit suite later. We saw other solutions in mixing dominant subjects earlier. Sometimes it's better not to record at all. That may be the best decision when contrasted to struggling with hours of setting EQ notches or drawing spectral repair to achieve frustrating results. Watch out for these problems. Gusts of wind, crickets or birds nearby, distant traffic or industry, machinery like buzzes or hums. Avoid the fix it in post mentality and solve problems now. A few minutes of work saves hours when mastering later. Use the flexibility that field recording allows to solve the problem instead of delaying the fix until later. Forgetting to listen. You wouldn't imagine it, but it's true. Even top tier pros forget to listen when recording. Sometimes they'll position a microphone next to a sparrow's nest when recording cars. Perhaps they'll record crowds without noticing distant music nearby. The result? The entire session is ruined. Field recording captures the sounds around us. How is it possible to forget to listen? Of course, no one's ears stop working. However, it's common for people to shut out sound. It's likely a natural compensation of the brain. The ear focuses on sounds that are most important and presents the rest in the background. Otherwise, how could we make sense of every sound around us? It would be an overwhelming wash of audio. Our ears discern critical details first. Field recording skill grows when we learn how to manipulate this. The best field recordists can shift this level of attention to hear and judge audio in our soundscape from the softest to the loudest and the closest to the most distant. With even more skill, a pro can pinpoint frequencies, intensities, and patterns. That takes effort and concentration though. When in a session, a field recordist must juggle dozens of priorities, gear, talent, performances, and more. With so much to sort out, often the environment or problem sounds aren't noticed at all. Examples, not noticing line hum or buzz from electromagnetic interference while listening in headphones. Missing hearing a soft television within a churning crowd. Recording shopping mall ambiences with distant music on the edge of hearing. Positioning a microphone next to chattering birds during a vehicle recording shoot. A low city drone rumble while recording crowds. The solution? Listen with intention. All it takes is to remain still for a moment before recording. Forget about the gear. Don't worry about the talent. Simply listen. Immerse yourself. After a few moments, mental chatter and fumbling activity will start to fade away. Shift your focus to hear audio beyond your subject. Another trick is to patrol your environment. Often, it's not possible to hear the rumbles or music from your recording position. Many times, they're nearly too faint to notice until you're in the edit suite. Walking 10 seconds in every direction from the microphone will reveal wisps of music or strands of buzzes and hums. It's even better to do this well before the shoot by scouting. It's not easy to do this when talent is waiting. It's challenging to check yourself when a unique sound is approaching. Under these pressures, it's forgivable to simply set up a microphone and press the record button and hope for success. Resist this. Instead, wait. Listen with intention before you begin. 
concentrate on audio other than your subject. You'll find your results will improve in the field and in the edit suite later. It's a surprising tip, but it's true. Take a moment to bring listening back to field recording, not just of your target, but of the world of sound around you. sound you're hearing are ocean waves recorded with a Neumann 191 microphone and Track 2 as Sound Devices 722 recorder. I captured them as a storm was just about to roll in off the coast of Lamai Beach in Thailand. So we can hear a little bit of rain trickling in. This is my first try at a podcast. It's completely a one-man show. The goal for this first podcast is just to get it out there. I want to improve my public speaking. For right now, I'm just recording to a DPA 4060 microphone track to a Sound Devices Mix Pre recorder. I'm still learning dialogue editing and everything that goes with it. So any comments, criticism, ideas on how I can improve is sincerely welcomed. Please let me know. Later, if this goes well, I'd like to introduce more features perhaps get some people on the podcast to talk about field recording. We'll see. Again, let me know what you think. Visit the blog at creativefieldrecording.com and click on the contact tab to get in touch. You can send your emails to paul at creativefieldrecording.com. You can follow the blog on Twitter at Paul Rostick and join Creative Field Recording on Facebook at fb.me slash creative field recording. Thanks for listening.